Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn to me. Uh, turn to with me. Excuse me. I did. Sorry, I, I didn't get to speak last Sunday, so I lost. A, I got to get back into habit here. Uh, turn with me, please, to Psalm chapter twenty-three. We're going to continue and conclude our series called "Setting the Table," getting ready to move into the Christmas season uh, next week. Uh, thank you to everybody who helped to decorate. Our decorations are not complete just yet. We got a few more things to do this week, but uh, I'm excited. You know, I, Christmas is one of those things that I usually don't get excited about until a week before, but I'm kind of excited about Christmas already, and uh, it's going to be a, a good year. I think probably the cold temperatures coming so early this year is putting us in the mood a little bit more uh, than most years. We've been talking about the, the table, setting the table, and what the table means to the Lord, and, and it means a, a whole lot of different things in our culture and our world today. But as you think of it, uh, last week you got together around a table with your family for Thanksgiving, probably ate way too much, uh, probably wobbled a little bit. With, I like that phrase, gobble till you wobble, you know, and that was certainly uh, applicable to me last week. And we probably do a lot more of that, especially as we come closer to Christmas. It seems like uh, we get together around food every time we get together and, and eating. And so when I say family feast, a lot of you have a picture in your mind, and it's different for most of you. But when they talked about a feast in the Bible or a table in the Bible, uh, the Jewish tradition was a lot different than our tradition today. Most of their food was eaten with hands. They didn't have forks and spoons and utensils like we have today. So when you see people talking about washing before they ate, it was a very important thing back then because hands were their, their, their uh, utensils that they used to eat with. So washing their hands was not only important, but many times they would wash their feet as well as they would come together into somebody's house uh, foot washing. And you know, Jesus did this with his disciples. It was uh, an ordinance really of the Lord and a ceremony where you would receive somebody. You would receive the the uh, uncomely parts of their life and they would take that which is most uh, unattractive in their life and put it in your hands and you would accept it and you would wash it. And there's something very spiritual about that. That's another message for another day. And we see stories as well where, where they would take oil and anoint their guests and pour it on them. And the woman that broke the uh, alabaster flask and poured the oil upon Jesus is, is symbolic of that as well. Bread was broken and eaten first, and bread was very important and, and very symbolic. And again, there was, uh, it wasn't slicing the bread. They didn't take knives. They broke it with their hands, and they, they handed it to each other. And there was a very, very spiritual dynamic to that. Uh, they would break bread and eat even before they would exchange a word, before they talked. It was, it was a very important thing. Uh, meals were oftentimes set up outside on, on porches or, or roofs because... Uh, when you got a, a large family together, their houses were not very big, and sometimes their houses couldn't contain anyone, uh, everyone. And we are talking about the table, but reality is they really didn't have tables back then. They would spread out a large mat on the floor, and they would sit on the floor. And, you know, when you see stories in the Bible of, of uh, the disciples leaning back on Jesus, it's because of how they were sitting on the floor. Many times they would recline and lean back and, and support each other and, and things like that. They, they didn't sit on chairs uh, but, but again, on the floor. And uh, there's a lot of different things. When, when guests would come, uh, they were seated at the table based on uh, order of, of honor or their status in life. And we read in the Bible that many times the disciples would fight over who got to sit at Jesus' right hand or left hand because where you sat at the table, and we have a lot of those traditions today, who sits at the head of the table and who sits on the right and left. And I'm sure if you're like our family, when we were kids growing up, everybody had their seat. And don't, don't sit in my seat at the table. We all had certain, certain seats. I, for the longest time, I sat at my dad's left hand, and uh, we had uh, my, my poor little brother. We had a table uh, with six chairs, and there were five kids in my family. There were seven of us all together. So my youngest brother, he sat in a high chair until he was about 10 years old, probably. <laughs> He was that small, he could fit in it, and uh, that was uh, one of our family traditions, because all we had was, we had to wait till somebody moved out before he could actually come and sit at the table. We only had six chairs. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms in the Bible, written by David. David was a, a shepherd, uh, but David, if you know the story and the life of David, uh, he was anointed at a very young age to become the next king of Israel. And he served in Saul's kingdom, in the, in the palace, uh, but Saul was very jealous of David. 
and tried to kill him. And so at one point, David had to leave the palace. Saul's son, Jonathan, helped David to leave. And he was out on the lamb, if you will, running from Saul, hiding in caves and sleeping on rocks out in uh, the wilderness. And, and many times he would go into the cities uh, and then that were um, occupied by, by the enemies of Israel just to get relief from having to run from Saul. And he writes in the fifth and the sixth verse of Psalm 23, he says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I, I like that last line because that's a statement of commitment. God, I will live in your house forever. I will, I will never stray from my relationship with you and my commitment to your house and to your kingdom. But I want to focus in on, on the first part of this passage here. Uh, God says, uh, David says, God prepares a table, a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. God's feasts are often set up in some uncomfortable places. Amen. You know, we would like to think that when you become a Christian, that God only leads us to places that are comfortable. But the passage that precedes this one says that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and yet I fear no evil because you're with me. Do you know that God's in the valley of the shadow of death? You know, a lot of Christians, they have this theology that if you're having problems or struggles or difficulty, God's not in that. God's in the valley of the shadow of death, and he will lead you through those places sometimes. And so don't, don't think just because everything's going great, well, God must be in this because everything's going great. Well, sometimes God sets up tables in some very difficult places in life and some challenging uh, places where we live. David was often found, as I said, in foreign nations, surrounded by enemies. And yet he says, Lord, even in these places, you prepare a table before me. You may be in a difficult place this morning. You may find yourself surrounded by your enemies. Uh, you know, we have that new song we've been singing that when, when I'm surrounded, I'm, I know I'm surrounded by you. Amen. Uh, when, when we're overwhelmed by our enemies, we know that God is right there with us. And, and God prepares a table for us even in the most difficult places of our life. So, so stop that, that mentality and that thinking that, man, things are going bad. God must not be here. He's right there with you. And he's preparing a table, even when you're surrounded by debt, even when you're surrounded by sickness, even when you're surrounded by difficulty and depression, even when you're overwhelmed by the, the, the problems of life, even when you've lost your job or you've lost your house or you've lost your hope or you've lost your confidence, there's a table right there. And God is calling you to come and sit down at the table. David probably didn't see many dinner tables when he was out running and hiding in caves and, 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 and living in the fields and sleeping outdoors. But he said, yet in the presence of my enemies, God is there. And he's setting up a table for me to feast on the things of heaven and the goodness. God's blessings flow even in challenging places. And you know, sometimes even though God is there and he's setting up a table for you, you can be distracted by the things going on around you. You know, there's been many a Thanksgiving where either my wife or, or the host uh, of the house that we're at, somebody in our family, has prepared this beautiful table and, and this great meal and, and, and put all these wonderful things to feast on on the table. And hours and days went into setting the table and preparing it and putting out the fine dishes and the fine silver and, and, and the stemware and things like that. And, and there's this beautiful table prepared to feast on but there's a football game on. <laughs> and, you know, we're sitting here trying to eat and, and even say grace, and you hear in the background, touchdown! Of course, it was never a Lions touchdown. It was always somebody else scored a touchdown. And, you know, there's a lot of distractions in life. But yet in the midst of all these things trying to pull you away from God, there's a table there that he set up for you to feed on. And you've got to take time away from those distractions and away from those difficulties and away from those enemies that you're fighting. And I know life can be a battle sometimes. And, and you can be so consumed with what the enemy is doing all around you that you don't take time to sit at the table of God, that you don't take time to feast on the things of God, that you don't take time to tune those things out. 
And we got into a practice at our house, man, when it's time to eat, you, you, we'll leave the TV on, but we'll at least turn the volume down so that we can focus on conversation with each other because there's so few times that we sit down as a family these days and actually enjoy each other's company. And, you know, we have so much going on in our life that you have to take those times in the midst of, of all the distractions and all the pressure and all the enemies of the cross that are fighting against your life and tune all of that out and turn down the volume and sit down in the presence of God and enjoy his company and enjoy his fellowship and listen to his voice and share your heart with him. Amen. Amen. The table of the Lord is so significant. It seemed like David was always looking over his shoulder. But in John chapter 10, in verse 10, it says, the thief or the enemy is there to steal and to kill and to destroy. But God is there. He set up a table that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So there's an abundant feast there for you. And I know I said this last time, but, but there's so many things to feast on. You know, when we become Christians, we celebrate the fact that, that we're saved from eternal damnation. We're saved from the wrath of God that will be poured out after the judgment. But that's not all there is to salvation. Salvation is, is a package that includes so many things on the table that, that God has prepared for us to feast on. And I know there's some that are easy and obvious, like peace and love and joy. But there's provision, and there's strength, and, and, and there's protection. And, and there's, there's so many things that you've just scratched the surface of God. You're just eating on the appetizers. And some of you haven't even gotten to the main course being led by His Spirit, being used by God, being empowered by His Holy Spirit, His mercy and His grace, not only filling your heart, but pouring out of you His forgiveness and His deliverance in your life. There are so many things that you can feed on at the table of the Lord. And He gives us these things in the midst of our enemies, in the presence of our enemies, in the midst of the storms of life. He sets up that table. So many people think that, that, that serving God and, and God moving means that all of those things that are enemies of our life don't exist, that they're absent. No, we live in a world that is crooked and perverse, the Bible says. We live in a world that, that would, before God got here was empty and chaotic. And since sin re-entered the world, it, it's chaotic again. We live in a world that the Bible says Satan is the God of this world system, this world's order, the way that things happen. And I'd love to be able to tell you today that as you begin to serve God, that every terrible thing in your life will just disappear. But I know some of you, you've struggled with disease, you've had loved ones die, you've had your houses destroyed with fires, you've lost your job, you've had people incarcerated in your life. There are so many things that you're going through in life and you think, man, but I'm serving God, these things shouldn't happen. No, no, there are enemies all around us. But what you have to realize in the midst of all of these enemies, there's a table that God is calling you to, to come and to sit down and to feast on love and joy, the strength that you need to endure, the mercy that you need, the grace that you need, the revelation that you need, the wisdom, the knowledge that you need. These are all things that he has spread out at this table. And a lot of times, people in, in Bible days were traveling quite a bit. There was always stories of somebody like the Good Samaritan going from one place to another. And it's not like they had a, a, a grocery store on the corner of, of, of every intersection or a pharmacy or a Home Depot or whatever it may be. If they wanted something, many times they had to travel for days to another city to go get it. Or a merchant would bring it to their city from a long ways away. And so people were constantly welcoming strangers and foreigners into their homes. And they would sit down at the dinner table together. And welcoming a stranger also... When you brought them into your home, it wasn't just a meal that you served them. You promised protection. You promised peace into their life. You promised to provide. You see stories of uh, when Isaac or, or, or Jacob went to find their wife and they were welcomed into somebody's home. They not only took care of them, they took care of all their servants and all of their horses and their cattle. And, and, and this was way, the ways that they would welcome people into their homes. Well, God, when he prepares a table before you and he welcomes you into his table, it's more than just a, a, a little meal to satisfy your flesh. It's his provision. It's his protection. It's his peace. You are a stranger in this world. The Bible says that our citizenship is in heaven. But in this world, we are strangers, pilgrims, traveling through, foreigners. 
But yet in the midst of us living in this world that, that we just don't feel like we fit anymore because we're not from this kingdom, we're from another kingdom, there's a table that God is calling us to, to sit down and to feast and be, be provided for and protected and receive the peace of God. And if you're not careful, all of these enemies and these things that are around the table, they can defile you. You know, God told Israel, when you go into the Canaan land, you've got to destroy all these things that will defile you. Don't, don't get connected with these people. Don't do business. Don't marry into their culture. Don't worship their gods. They were all kind, even though they lived in the Canaan land, there were still enemies there. And this is why the symbolism of, of washing before you sit down to eat, that's what it's all about. God wants you to begin to cleanse your heart and to cleanse your mind and to cleanse your life before you sit down and you feast on the things of God. You know, a lot of times we come into church, and, and it's funny, I, I get a kick out of people in the same service. I'll have two people come up to me after the service. This happened many times. And one will say, man, God was just there this morning. I felt him. The presence of God was so thick. And another person will come up and say, man, I'm just not feeling the presence of God anymore. And what, what's the difference? Well, I think one prepared their heart before they came to the table. One washed their hands. One came in with their hands dirty. And as they began to feed on the things of God, all of those things that had defiled them, it, it began to infiltrate the things of God. And, and that attitude they brought with them and that heart of bitterness they brought with them and that negativity they brought with them. And as they began to eat the food, it was on their hands and it got into the presence of God and it got into worship. And, you know, this one, uh, I, I didn't like they sang too loud and this one didn't say hi to me. And, and this one was sitting in my seat and, you know, worship was too loud. Worship was too long. Worship, it was too warm in that building this morning. What happened, man? You, you didn't wash your hands before you got to the meal. Amen. <laughs> When you come and you feast on the things of God, you've got to cleanse your heart. You've got to prepare yourself for the meal that God is preparing for us. And so come clean. And it says they would anoint them with oil. I love this. It says, you anoint my head with oil. If you're going to be battling enemies, this oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and they would put it on their head and sometimes even on their feet. And I love in the Old Testament... You know, they, they took it and they poured it on their head until it went down all over their body. You need the presence of the Holy Spirit in the midst of your enemies. And I know that they cooked a lot of stuff in that oil. They not only put it on them, they put it in them. <laughs> Hallelujah. We need the oil of the Holy Spirit in the presence of our enemies. And when you're in the presence of your enemies, you'll find God's presence there. Even in the most challenging places, the oil of the Holy Spirit is flowing to fill your heart, to change your thoughts, to take that bitterness, to take that criticism, that judgmentalness out of your life, and to minister to you and to strengthen you. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here there are two things that I find fascinating about this passage. Not only does Christ save us by making us alive in Him, but He also seats us with Him in heavenly places. Now this speaks of our God-given authority here on the earth today. As we make ready our gifts and our offerings, we're willing participants in God's great power as He ex exercises His plans on the earth. The plan that reveals the kindness of Jesus and the riches of his incomparable grace. Now, whatever your gift is today, know that you're God's handiwork and that this exchange is for me and it's for you as well, so that we can be willing participants in the good work that Christ has prepared in advance for us to walk in. If you're giving electronically, please reference the web address below. Let's pray. Father God, we know that it is by grace that we have been saved, Lord, and it's, it's not by works so that none of us can boast, Father. 
as we make ready our, our gifts and our offerings, Lord, we don't do it in a boastful manner. We don't do it to boast in our humanity or in our own riches, Father. We do it because of the grace you so richly showed us, Father. We offer these, these gifts and these offerings to you, Father, so that you can express the kindness of Christ Jesus, so that we can be willing participants in your great plan here on the earth, Father. We worship you with this offering, Father. And as that act of worship, Father, we participate with you in what you're doing. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And as I said earlier, a lot of times when they sat down to a feast, it wasn't just their immediate family. It was it was uh, it wasn't uncommon for them to welcome a stranger, a neighbor, somebody that they would invite to the feast because God's feast, number three in your outline, were meant to be shared. They were meant to be shared. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible where it talks about Jesus when he was in the, the heavenly realms. We know that he was feasting on everything that was available in God's kingdom. But it says that he didn't consider his position with God, something to be grasped. And if you look that up really in the original language, it means something to be held on to. So he set aside his position with God and came to this earth so that we could enjoy what he was feasting on in heaven. And so we need to understand as Christians, when you begin to feast on things of God, it's not meant for you to hoard unto yourself, for you just to hang on to, man, this is good stuff. I'm not going to share this with anybody else. And, and, and I'll do that sometimes. I'll sit down at a, at, a, at a meal and I'll order something and, and Lynn will think to herself, you know, I, I'd like to order that, but I'm going to order this instead. And I'm into me eating it and it's so good. I'm like halfway into it and it's, my plate is getting clean really fast. And she'll say, is that good? No, it's not any good. You wouldn't like that at all. I say that because I know she's going to want to eat some of what I've eaten and I want it all for myself. And, you know, a lot of us are like that with our spirituality. We just get as much as we can for ourselves, and that's okay. But God doesn't want you to be a container. He wants you to be a conduit. Amen? He wants whatever he's blessing you with to flow through you, not just to hoard it up and hang on to it, but to release it. It's not just open to the family, but feasts are open to people that aren't even members of the family. And, you know, we need to reach outside the family of God and share the things that we're feasting on. If you're feasting on hope and joy and peace, Lord knows there's a world full of people that need those things. And so take them a plate of leftovers, man. Because whenever you're feeding on God, there's always leftovers. He's a God of abundance. He's not just the God of, of just getting by. He's not the God of hanging in there. He's not the God of, uh, 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 of you know, I, I'm just barely making it. He's the God of more than enough. <clears throat> so when you're feasting on the things of God, get your Tupperware ready, man, because there's going to be leftovers. And so God wants us to begin to share it with other people. Look what it says here in Luke chapter 5. I'm going to start reading in, in verse 29. And we know Levi, <clears throat> who's referred to in this scripture better by the name Matthew, it says, later Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum, they asked. Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call, not to, or excuse me, I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Amen. Matthew had just given his life to Christ. And he invites Jesus over for dinner. And most of you would say, man, I can't wait for this moment. I'm going to shut the door. It's just me and Jesus. I'm going to talk to him. He's going to talk to me. I'm going to feed on the presence of Jesus. I can't wait to get alone with him. But that wasn't Matthew's heart. He says, hey. He calls everybody he knows. He used to be a tax collector. He hung out with some, as, as the scripture says, some, some scum, <laughs> some uh, well-known sinful people. And he calls them all up and invites them over to dinner. 
Jesus is coming to my house. You guys need to come over. I want you to feast on his mercy and his forgiveness and his wisdom and his revelation and his healing and his deliverance. Hallelujah. And then these self-righteous people, there's still Pharisees in the church today. They get their snobby nose up in the air. I can't believe who they're sharing a meal with. Who else would you share the things of God with but the people that need it the most? We want to always judge other people. that The things of God are for these people. <laughs> Who are they for then? And I got news for you. You was one of those people not too long ago. Amen? If somebody hadn't shared a meal with you, you'd still be one of those people that the righteous snobs call scum of the earth. Chase alluded to this scripture last week in Acts chapter 10 and verse 28. He says, Peter told them, you know it's against our laws for, Jewish, uh, for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with people from another nation. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Hallelujah. Cornelius invited Peter into his home and, and, and they fought for just a minute those those racist things in their mind those traditional things in their mind and you know you're a gentile i'm a jew we're not supposed to be sharing a meal together but god had just revealed to peter that nobody nobody is unclean in the sight of god and all of the things of god need to be shared with everybody that we can and so god sets his table in the midst of enemies so that we can share his blessings with them Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said these words in verse 43. He says, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. And he shares meals with them all. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Number four, God's table is a thanksgiving table. God's table is a table of thanks. And I hope that when you sit down at the table, and especially at Thanksgiving or Christmas, that you take a moment to just thank God. Because there's a lot of people that don't have a table. There's a lot of people that don't have a dining room to put a table in. There's a lot of people that don't have food on that table or a, a, a roof over their head. Amen. My niece has a, uh, an orphanage in Haiti, and we were at a, a dinner fundraiser for her this week, and I had the honor of visiting the nation of Haiti about four or five years ago. And you don't really appreciate what you have until you go to a nation like this, where there are people that just basically have nothing. I mean, the, the metal sheds that you see in some people's backyard that have like the corrugated metal around them are nicer than most of the homes that I saw in Haiti. Most of them were made from that type of metal, but not screwed together, just kind of leaning against each other. I went into an orphanage one time, and, and uh, we were touring several different orphanages, and I had to use the restroom. And uh, they said, it's, it's over there. And there was this wooden enclosure, and I walked in, and, and the, the restroom was basically a, a hole in the ground. And they had taken some, I think, concrete and kind of molded something that resembled uh, a seat to sit on. And that was their, their toilet. And I mean, the, the, the roads, we complain about the potholes here in the United States. Every road was like the surface of the moon. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And do you know that the thing that struck me the most was the joy on the hearts of all of the people that lived there? They didn't complain. They, 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 they were thankful for everything that they had. And, you know, we have so much, but yet we forget to be thankful for what we have. And so many times you, you don't get thankful till you're, you're living without it. <laughs> I remember when I lost my job, how thankful I became of having a job. Well, I remember when those days when you didn't know where your groceries were going to come from or how you were going to pay your rent. I, I'm thankful now for every, every time I'm able to write the house payment or, 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 or to sit down and, and eat at the table. God's table is a Thanksgiving table. And we mentioned to this earlier, verse 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you're close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me and comfort me. God prepares a table in the valley 
of the shadow of death, even in the valleys of life, even in those moments where you've lost your job and, and you're behind on your rent, and the foreclosure notices come in the mail, even in those places, God prepares a table for you. And not just the valley, it says here, the valley of the shadow of death. I know we've all gone through some valleys, but few of us have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, where your days are, are numbered and, and, and life is about to end. God still has a table there for you. God's people sit down and give thanks at that table. And I want you to know this morning that we need to give thanks even when. Or even though, even though I got a foreclosure notice, I still need to give thanks for the roof over my head. Even though I lost my job, I still want to sit down at that table and give thanks. Even though it feels like all hell is breaking loose in your life, you still need to sit down at that table. See, so many of us, we have this notion and this mindset that I'll thank God when everything in my life is in order, when all of my prayers are answered. I'll wait until my prayer is answered to thank God. No, you need to thank God even though that prayer hasn't been answered. Even though you've been praying that prayer for 20 years and it still hasn't been answered. Even though you're walking around with a limp. Even though you've been battling a sickness even though your child's in the hospital, even though you're going through things, even though your house has been burned out, even though you still need to sit down and give God thanks. Hallelujah. <clears throat> because he's worthy of our praise. And even in the midst of that, he's prepared a table. Even though you cough when you start to preach. Oh, thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> God is good. All the time. Amen. We like to say those little cliches in church, but do we really believe it? When you get that pink slip and, and you've lost your job and you're behind on your bills and it's two weeks before Christmas, do you still say, God is good all the time? Or I like this one. Somebody taught me this a few years ago. We love to say God is good, but can you say God is good to me? God is good to me. Can you say that this morning? Say that with me. God is good to me. Amen. I remember that day, and I've shared this testimony a few times, but I was working at an advertising agency. Sterling was uh, one going on two. And when your kids are young, Spencer hadn't been born yet. Christmas is a big deal. And we had went out and bought toys for him and, you know, my wife, she doesn't wait till the week before Christmas to shop. We start shopping in sometimes September, you know, and getting things and getting them ready. And the house is decorated, and it'll be our son's second Christmas. And we're, we're just so excited. And two weeks before Christmas, my boss calls me into her office and says, we're going to have to let you go. It was a tearful day. It was a difficult day. We didn't know what to do. What, do you unwrap the kids' gifts and take them back to the store? I was four months I was out of work. What do you do? You thank God. Amen. Even though, even though you don't know what's going on. Even though you don't know when you're going to work again. Even though you don't know how you're going to pay for Christmas. Even though you don't know where your groceries are going to come from. Even though the, <clears throat> the heat bill is higher in the wintertime. And you don't know how you're going to pay it. You thank God. You thank God even though, even though you're in the presence of your enemy, there's still a table to sit down and to give thanks at. In Psalm 42, verse 11, David says, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. I want you to picture David for just a minute again. He couldn't live in the palace. And even though Saul was looking to kill him, and even though he had a rock for a pillow, and even though he often had to, to hide in caves, and even though Saul's army was coming over the next hill to try to kill him, and, and, and even though he had to lie and go stay with the enemies, and, and, and even though he didn't know how to eat and where his food was going to come from, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. But then he went out and said, my God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And he had many. He had enemies within his own country, and he had enemies in the countries that surrounded where he was. 
He wrote these words in Psalm 34 and verse 6. He says, in my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel, and, and a lot of people read that to say he never uh, allowed me to go through any troubles. It doesn't say that. Some people think that you become a Christian and you'll never have any troubles. No, but he saved me from all of my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Oh, the joys of those who sit down at that table in the presence of their enemy and taste on the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. God's table didn't just have a bowl of cereal on it. God's table didn't just have a, a, a TV dinner. Amen. He says, my cup runs over. My cup runs over. God's table was a table of abundance. The word anoint here, when, when he says you anoint my head with oil, the word anoint means to make someone fat. When you sat down at the, the, the table of the Lord, you got full. He fattened you up with his thing. A thankful cup is one that runs over with blessings. God's blessings don't come in the absence of enemies. They come in the midst of our enemies. Amen. God's blessings don't come in the absence of storms, in the absence of conflict, in the absence of pressure. They come right in the middle of it. There's a table in the middle of whatever that you're going through this morning. And God wants you to sit down and thank him and taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> taste on whatever, feast on whatever it is that you need this morning. Whatever it is that, that, that you're having a craving for. Whatever it is that, that, that you're tasting. You know, a lot of times Lynn and I <clears throat> will we'll go out somewhere to eat. And what are you hungry for? And if you're like us, it takes about two hours to figure that one out, you know. <laughs> Well, we just had this yesterday, and I'm not really into something spicy, so we're going to leave uh, uh, Mexican food out. Well, well, what about fast food? No, we can't eat fast food. We'll blow up like a balloon, you know. What about steak? Well, you know, that's kind of expensive. We can't really... I mean, I will just go through the whole gamut, uh, and finally, we'll probably either end up in an argument or go home and cook something to eat, you know. But God wants to know what you're hungry for, because he's prepared a table. And he's put that at the table because he loves you and he cares about you and he thinks of you. And whatever it is, God has it for you. They filled their cups at these tables with usually wine. Again, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want you, and, and this is part of what I was trying to indicate earlier. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you. It's like putting a little wine in your cup. Okay, he's in me. But that's not all God wants to do in your life. He doesn't want to just give you a, a, a taste of the Holy Spirit. You know, some of these people, they go to the wine tasting and they put just a little thing in there and you get the taste. That's not what God's looking to do. He wants your cup to be running over. He wants to fill you so full of the Holy Spirit that he's not just in you, but he's flowing out of you to be a blessing to other people. See, something's not filled unless it's running over, right? I mean, if, if there's still a little bit in the top, it's not full. It's not full until it's running over the sides. God wants your spirit to be so full of him that other people can taste and see that the Lord is good because he's flowing out of you. Finally, this morning, the final verse of our, our, our text here, if you go to verse 6, it says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. When you pursue God, God's blessings will pursue you. When you pursue God, God's blessings will pursue you. And, and, and it, it, it's, that's what the word is. Not follow you. They will pursue you. The word pursue means to chase down like a predator, to harass, to persecute you. God wants to harass you with his blessings. God wants to persecute you with his blessings. God wants to hunt you down and give you the blessings. David, had, he knew what it was like to be hunted down. He knew what it like, was like to be persecuted and harassed. He, he knew how Saul had hunted him down. And, and he uses this as an analogy. Just like I've been hunted for years, God wants to hunt you down, not to kill you, but to bless you, to give you blessings. Hallelujah. 
my mom used to always, when we were kids growing up and we were going off to school every morning, she'd chase us out that front door. You got your money, you got your, your lunch, you got your books, you got your homework. And man, it, sometimes it was just embarrassing because mom didn't take a shower before she came out that front door. And she didn't always get dressed before she came out that front door. And sometimes the hair would be everywhere and she's got this nightgown on and I'm, my friends are walking down the sidewalk and I come out the front door to catch up. And here comes mom out the front door pursuing me. You got your milk? My Shh, mom, go back in the house. You got your lunch? You know, mom, go put your robe on. You know? God will pursue you with blessings until you're embarrassed by what he's been doing in your life. Amen? I mean, my wife and I are so blessed, sometimes I'm embarrassed to tell you how blessed we are. God will pursue you to the point with goodness and mercy. And when you pursue him, he will pursue you and bless you to a point where you'll be embarrassed to tell other people how blessed you are. That's the God that we serve. His goodness, I believe, represents the provisions of earth. He will harass you with those. His mercy represents the provisions of heaven, and they will also chase you. And once you eat at God's table, you won't want to get up. <laughs> Amen? Once you sit down and eat at God's table, you, you don't want to leave. When I was a kid, my dad, on Mondays, he always had Mondays off, and in the summertime, I'm home from school, and I'd sit down at the table. I'd get up, you know, kids, 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'd start eating breakfast, and breakfast would be done, and 11 o'clock, I'm starting to eat lunch, you know? And Dad would come in, and he'd say, you still eating? I'd say, no, it's the same meal. It's just been going on for a few hours, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's the way it is with God, man. You won't want to get up from the table. You'll want to just keep eating, and one meal will roll into another and into another, and, and you'll say, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I don't want to leave your presence. Like Moses said when they were wandering in the wilderness, God, I, I know you want me to go to a different place, but I don't want to go if your presence doesn't go with me. I don't want to leave your table. I want to make sure that table that's been following us and pursuing us goes with me when we go into the promised land. Hallelujah. Is anybody getting anything out of this this morning? God is so good, isn't he? I want you to know this morning that in the Jewish culture, friends, he says there, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, visitors would come and eat meals, but, but friends didn't live in the house, and servants didn't live in the house, and foreigners, merchants, they, they didn't live in the house. Only family dwelled in the house of the Lord or dwelled in the house of the person uh, that they were eating. They would stay the night. They would, they would live there forever. And so the only way really to dwell in the house of the Lord forever is to become part of his family. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me this morning. If you're here today and you're not sure you're a child of God, I'm not saying you can't eat off of his table from time to time, but once you begin to, to taste and see that the Lord is good, you're going to want to be part of his family. And I've shared this morning with you some of the good things about God. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm a child of God. I'm not sure I'm part of his family. I don't want you to leave this place today without being sure. And you know, there's a lot of people that they think you, you really can't be sure. Nobody really knows. You have to live a good enough life. And we don't know if we've lived a good enough life. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says you can know that you've passed from death unto life. The Bible says if you confess with your heart that Jesus is Lord and believe in, in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved, that you'll be a child of God. If you're here today and you're not sure, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. And I'll lead everybody in the room this morning in that prayer for your benefit today so that you can leave here knowing that you're part of God's family. This isn't a prayer that you got to pray over and over and over again. You just got to mean it when you pray it and live it when you're done praying it because we're going to challenge you to give your life to God and make a commitment to live in his house. And if you mean business with that, when you say this prayer, 
God will radically change your life forever. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, that's me. I want to pray that prayer, but I'm not sure. Pastor, I, I, I'm embarrassed. I don't want everybody to know. Listen, we're not here to embarrass you. We're not going to point you out. We're not going to call you forward. We're not going to expose you. But I'm going to ask you to, to do one thing. It's very simple. It's a step of faith. It's a step of courage. It takes guts to do this. But people's heads are bowed. Nobody's looking around. They're praying for you. If that's you, Pastor. I, lead me in that prayer this morning. Lead us all in that prayer so I can pray it today. Just lift your hand up. You can put it right back down. I, I want to know that I'm a child of God, that I'm in his family. Amen. I see hands all over the room. You can put your hand back down. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray this prayer together. And if that's you, pray it from the depth of your heart and pray it with the intention of living it when we're done praying. Say this. Say, God, I need you in my life. My life requires your control. So I give my life to you today. I ask you to become my Lord, my leader. Guide me. Speak to me. Lead me to your table so that I might feast on your goodness. God, my hands are dirty. I confess that there's sin in my life. And I'm not qualified to be in your presence. But I receive Jesus and the work of the cross to cleanse my hands and qualify me to live in your house forever. I accept you today as my Savior. And I make a commitment to live for you from this day forward with all of my heart. I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's give God praise this morning.